You're tuned to Planet Vera Radio. I am Cindy Schwartz, and this is the Patient Partner Show. I've got Jeannie Roller on uh, with me with on live stream. She's in Indiana. Today we're going to talk about a couple of the rules, actually statutes. So I got it in front of me, the Florida Statutes, Chapter 458, Medical Practice, which encompasses the rules and the laws and those kind of things that govern how you can operate literally and figuratively in the medical arena in the state of Florida. And I also... What um, got me involved with that is I did happen to get an email, and it was about the North Carolina Medical Board. And some of the things are kind of interesting. It's, the rules are kind of comparable from state to state. It says there are 71 medical boards in the United States, so they're all 50 states, and then the territories included. So I thought that was interesting because each one should have their own medical board. And just what the guidelines and stuff are and also who the medical boards are made up of. In North Carolina, there's 13 members, eight are doctors. One is a physician assistant. One is a nurse practitioner. And there are three public consumer uh, ones that are on the board members. And they in Florida, it consists of the consumer ones as lawyers. So I'll skip to Florida, and Florida has uh, 15 members, 12 are doctors, three are consumer members, two of those are lawyers, and one is the senior director of patient safety at Tampa General Hospital. So these are your consumer members. I always thought Jeannie Rolla, actually a consumer member, would be more of a person, maybe maybe not exactly like we are as patients, but just an entity that didn't really have anything to do with either the law or the medical system, if you will, somebody that's, you know, unbiased completely across the board, but it doesn't look like it in these two instances. And so I just want to highlight a couple of things because we do talk about this all the time on the podcast of things that we thought went wrong in our care and the people that we interview thought went wrong in their care and their procedures and whatever. And we're finding when I read this, that there are actually laws that say that you shouldn't be doing this medical people that I am not going to say we're right, they're wrong, but I mean, here's the law and the stuff that I read in my own medical records was not accurate. And it says right here, Florida Statute 456.072, grounds for discipline, penalties, enforcement for the medical staff, for doctors. And Section L says making or filing a report which a licensee, which would be the doctor or the medical person, knows to be false. So you had the same yeah. scenario with yours and the people that we've interviewed on here, the same scenario. You know, they're saying, well, that we that wasn't us. We That didn't happen to us. This is what really happened. So... I mean, that's just one instance. I mean, making deceptive, untrue, or fraudulent representations in or related to the practice of a profession or employing a trick or scheme, <coughs> excuse me, in or related to the practice of a profession is against its, that's M in that section. So when the doctor tells you one thing for your care, oh, this is the way that you should go and doesn't explain anything else and tells you, well, that one that I'm telling you is the gold standard of care in my opinion the doctor's opinion how do you read that I mean when they don't tell you okay you know for argument's sake breast cancer surgery okay well the best thing the gold standard of care is to have your breast cut off (laughs) well according to whose standards is the gold standard of care I mean I would think that that section in this would would be addressing that so shouldn't the patient know the other things Jeannie I don't know what do you think about all this well, I believe you're right, Cindy. Patients should know. The patients should know all the alternatives because the gold standard doesn't mean it's the best for that particular patient. The gold standard means mostly that that is the most popular thing that they're doing at the present time. That means the, the hospital and the doctor has invested quit equipment cost and educational cost in doing the gold standard rather than the other alternatives. That's what it generally means. And um, so, yes, the patient should know all the alternatives. And the patient is actually the captain of the healthcare team, not the doctor, the patient. Right. Well, you know, what I found out when I had that statement said to me by a doctor, um, a pulmonologist and then a, and a thoracic surgeon, and I did my investigation because I was just couldn't believe that that's all that was presented to me. I found out that those doctors weren't capable of doing the other things so therefore they didn't present it to me 
Now, should they have said, well, you know, we're, we're not capable of doing the, or, you know, word it however they want to word it, instead of just leaving me with, well, this is the gold standard of care. You know, to right. me, it's like a car well, salesman yeah. saying, well, if you, if you buy this silver, whatever, Acura, that's the best car that you can buy. Because he's selling that car. Right. And that's how doctors are. That's certainly true in cardiology, that if they don't do other types of treatments, they are going to recommend and usually only recommend the, the, the type of treatment that they are trained to do. Mm-hmm. They're not going to say, hey, go over to, and try this one rather than this. They're going to recommend you have the one that they are trained in doing and that the hospital needs to recoup the cost of the equipment. And that's the other big thing. Hospitals want them to do certain procedures to recoup the cost of all the equipment and all the training. So is that then on the consumer, which that's what we are even in the medical setting where the consumer, is that on us and the consumer to do our legwork or is it in the doctor's interest to to present? I, I don't know. I mean, is it a rhetorical question? We could talk about this all day long, all week, all year. Is it the doctor's job legally, ethically to say, well, it you is. know, well, that's what I think. I mean, that that's personally what I think because a lot of this paperwork. Yeah. I mean, look up look up the statutes in, in in the Florida Chapter 458 Medical Practice that ethically the doctor should say, okay, well, you can have your breast cut off, you can have uh, chemotherapy. This is what's going to happen. You can have radiation. This is what's going to happen, and just leave it at that. You know, not label it the gold standard of care. Not label it. You know, this is the best procedure. Whatever kind of thing. I think that right. I'm with you. Right. And, you know, what makes something the gold standard of care in a certain area in the country? That That's the other thing. How is a gold standard? How do they come about making something a gold standard? Yeah, I just I said because, that because it personally happened to me. So I just remember hearing it and I couldn't right. believe it. And I want to say this, too. And this is in the Florida statute as well. 458. And I interrupted Eugenie and I'll let you go in a minute. Um, it also says the physician patient relationship is founded on mutual trust. That's right in there in the statute. Right. So when that trust is obliterated, what do we do? Yeah, and that's that's where your husband or my husband and you are at. That trust has been has been just completely bulldozed over. There is no trust anymore. So well for um, that doctor. I mean, I have tr- myself personally. Yeah. I have trust in other doctors. So I mean, that's a personal call. People have to decide what's best for them. Uh, Section P, the person is not qualified by training, experience, or authorization when required to perform certain techniques. Well, that happens with the surgery techs. They're not licensed, trained, or whatever, but yet, I mean, I've interviewed people on this podcast that said, I'm training surgery techs. They're not trained to suture up and to do this and that, but yet the surgeon is leaving the room and saying, okay, go ahead, finish the procedure. I'm on to my next one. Why is nobody held accountable for that? I mean, I've heard that over and over again. They've left the text to clean this up. And I'm not talking about cleaning the bedpan. I'm talking about suturing the patient up. I, I've had it on this podcast. You can read, you can listen to f- uh, former podcasts that I've posted on here where uh, professors that train these surgery techs are saying that the techs are coming back telling us this is what they're doing. Nobody's held accountable well, for this. And- but how does the patient ever know? It's not going to say that in the medical records right. because there again, what right. you brought up earlier, the medical records can be fudged easily. Yep. And a lot of times they are, at least they were in my husband's case. They, they have so many lies, just outright lies in them. We don't know what the truth is. Right. So if you have a nurse or somebody else that's in that and says that's a lot of times that's what, ha- that's what happens. I saw so-and-so do this, you know, that's why the so-and-so happened. I mean, unless you have like a whistleblower or something like that. And that's also one of the statute in the statutes in here that says this stuff should be told. If you as a medical right. professional see this, you have an, a legal obligation in these statutes to say something. And what are the most ad- generally they won't. They won't generally. I, I mean, I get it. I do, but you know, people's lives are at stake here. I'm sorry, but we're going to keep talking about this, Jeannie. I got to say, another another segment on patient partners. And you've been listening to Planet Vero Radio. Please stay tuned. 